Tossing Grenades at Windmills Podcast. The tricky part was pretending to be a demon. When he tried to find the first vulnerable soul, they had just laughed and sent him packing. So the sec- so had the second and third, and the fourth had actually gotten angry enough to call the police. Lamp and Sherm had barely escaped. He had spent three days and three nights holed up in his quarters, expecting the police to come knocking at the door, or at least an outraged cardinal. Apparently, no one did. He read in the paper that a man had committed that the man he had spoken to had been committed to a mental institution. Perhaps some had thought him just making trouble, but Lamp and Sherman couldn't take that chance. He had to act and fast. So he read up on an illusion spell that covered up all the senses: sight, smell, touch, and sound. He didn't care about taste. <laughs> But he needed to act quickly and at night. He waited until he was near the fourth person on the list and cast the spell entering the window. A Gillies was easy. A scrappy little Frenchman who lived 60 miles north of Nice in a crumbling little chateau with a remarkably sophisticated computer connected to devices that Lampensherm would not even try to understand. There were various faded left-wing popular polist- political posters on the wall. Lamp and Sherm practically expected the thin man to wear a beret and smoke a long, thin cer- cigarette. He did neither, but he did have a long, thick, trailing, b- curly black beard. What do you mean I have his soul? I mean, Lamp and Sherm asked, trying to sound impressive with his bat wings and fire truck skin, that you have a soul, and in exchange for it, can you give me the power to find things that are hidden? Agilis leaned closer, a look of extreme hunger in her face. Well, sure, but what about wealth or women or wine or song? This life is really all there is. The next is a matter of which sucks slightly less. Don't care about it. Agili snapped his fingers in Lampensherm's face. For a moment, Lampensherm almost lost his temper. He was not used to fi- being taunted with deference as a cardinal, but he also knew well aware that he was trying to crush Agilis like an insect given his current form. He took a Deep, calming breath. Why do you want that? Agili snapped his fingers in Lampensherm's face. Look, you offered me power. I told you what I want. Give it to me. That This would have been a lot easier if he'd been an actual demon, but he... Wait a minute. What was he thinking? He'd done the deal. Now he'd let the devil take care of the details. I'll get back to you. He contacted Marmathon. What? Marmathon looked like he was eating something as the shivering smoke showed the, wind, the shadow of his image... Lampensherm tried to pretend it was not a human femur. I have a soul. What? There was a long pause. Okay, uh, good for you. Marmonthon wiped his mouth. He wants power, but I'm not sure how to grant it or deliver his soul to the devil. We don't really cover that part. And before Lampensherm could finish his sentence, a pad of preformed legal contracts with blank spaces shimmered beneath the incense. Use that. Get him to sign in blood. The rest takes care of itself. Good job, Lampensherm. I just lost 50 souls betting against you. I won't make that mistake again. For having just lost a bet, Marmathon seemed awfully pleased. Why was that? But before Lampensherm could ask more details, Marmathon cut off communication. Lampensherm took the forms and tore the first one in half and then walked to the the front door and knocked. He was... Uh, Achilles was dressed down, but he had a, his cross and informal vestments as he did. When Agilis opened the door, he looked at Lampensherm up and down. Yeah? Yes? Taking the contract in one hand and a sharp pen in the other, he handed it to Agilis. What? What is this? Agilis was a terrible liar. This is my human disguise. Agilis didn't really look like he was buying it, but nodded. After closing the door, he kept looking at Lampensherm for a long time, and finally he said, Yes, okay. Your voice is the same. And without any further hesitation, he dipped the pen into his forearm and signed his name. There was no glow or magical shimmer or swarm of bats or anything. Agilis just looked at Lampensherm and then nodded. Oh, yes, that makes sense. What makes sense? You are a liar, and you sold your soul. Not a bad deal, actually. I might see if I can trade three to get a deal myself. Well, four, since I don't have mine to offer either. But I'm more concerned about this reality right now. He began chuckling and showed Lampensherm to the door, just like that. Lampensherm felt a little put out, but wasn't sure why. You're upset, he heard from the window. 
Because I showed be awed by a supernatural experience, you're forgetting my second, not my first. Magic sounds interesting, by the way. Call me a few weeks, and I might have something to trade for those magic books. But then again, you will hardly need them anyway to succeed, won't you? Straight down to hell, I suppose. Anyway, totals. He waved and shut the door again in Lampenstrom's face. Lampenstrom laughed, shook his head, and went to the next soul on the list. Malvario Asario was almost as easy as Achilles. He wanted the ability to heal from grievous injuries when, within his regular lifespan. It took an extra special contract that was extra ironclad for the extra ability to heal. Dude, my soul was totally worth it. What circle of hell do you think I'm going to? He spoke with a strange accent, a rather thick one. I don't know, maybe sloth or murder. I didn't kill anyone, and I'm not killing myself either. Hey, you want to come? Maybe you're a demon. You can try it out. I re... What? Malvalio signed the contract and grinned. Come on, you're two-thirds of the... Come on, you're two-thirds of the way there. We should celebrate. And so that night, carousing with Malvalio, they started at one bar and kept on going. Lampensherm knew a spell to cure himself, so he was able to keep going for quite some time. And Malvalio... Mal, Malvalio... Malavio just got better as he got sick. Lampenshern grew bored after the 20th pub, but Mal Malavio wanted to keep going. He just kept drinking more and more and more. By the time they hit the 30th bar, Lampenshern was ready to leave, but Malavio drank and drank and drank until he died. At first, Lampenshern didn't believe it. He read the second version of the contract himself. The healing abilities were supposed to grant, it was supposed to grant was incredible. Suddenly, he was doubting this whole demon thing if contracts were that easy to break. There was a whisper in the shadows from him from behind him. Psst. Lampenstrom turned around. It was Snithers, half buried in the shadows. What do you want? I wanted to warn you. About what? Lampenstrom said as he looked around, not sure how, what to make of the situation. Snithers had chosen his spot well. Your thoughts on the contract. Remember, we can read minds, and if you're being watched constantly, we have a deal. You can't fulfill it if you're having doubts. You're making waves after a major victory. You are right. You'll have power. Lots of it. I need you to understand. Understand what, precisely? Lampenstrom rubbed his eyes and listened as they leaned down to listen. This had all gotten unreal. How we operate. And by operate, I mean we, not us demons. You have the rest of your natural life to get a soul, and I think you're overestimating both how much that God's heaven knows and interferes. Surprisingly, despite his misgivings, he felt a heavy weight lift from his chest. Aside from the pre-programmed love uh, that from for God that humans had, he had a very a very good idea how much angels were capable of. And hell, unless you piss off one of the archfiends, no one wants to piss off someone who might you have a lot of power. You're a random factor, and that scares you scares them more than you can imagine, but you must not think hell is unfair. As a human, you don't know this, but we consider being fair very important, vital. Lampenstrom blinked. It wasn't so much that he automatically thought that the demons would hate to, the idea of being fair to just being evil, so much as that he hadn't thought about it at all, and subconsciously he just assumed a general that they had a general hatred of humanity. It's true. Most of us hate humanity. I among them, mostly. But you see, it's precisely because we hate you that we honor our contracts. It isn't a business ethical or ethic or because he makes us. It's because it's our way of proving we were right. We always honor our word. Humans always try and get out of the contract. So much, so as much as there are many of us who hate you, the snark dreamman shrugged. Finally, Lampenstrom understood. We share a common disappointment in that, in that of God's treatment of us. That and a commitment to find a way to show de defiance in an unjust universe. We can't beat God, and we can't choose who we are within the parameters of what we do. We choose to be on honorable when humanity's not. You choose to be something else besides a token to be wagered over in a ridiculously one-sided fight. Hell stands no chance in the end, and everyone knows it, but we're compelled to do it because it's written that way in sacred scripture. Snithers smiled sardonically and leaned against something invisible. Well... I'll take what I can get, Lampensherm said, feeling much better. Not great, but he felt better about his decisions. That's the spirit, Snithers said, and vanished in a puff of logic or something. It didn't smell like brimstone, that was for sure. Lampensherm was shocked beyond imagining when the list said Sister Magnolia. She was so pure, so innocent. He was taking a great risk in talking to her. In fact, it was a solid three weeks before he did. He kept looking at the next people on the list, and all which were much more difficult to contract. 
Hell was taking the long view and put no pressure on him whatsoever. Even after he rationalized that there, there was no fundamental difference between that of God's heaven and hell, he still put another had, had another two weeks b before he could talk to her with the knowledge of having another human in his life who might f make it all more frighteningly real. He came up to her desk and asked, Have you read Das Kapel Faust Kanto? She shook her head. I admit I have not, Your Excellency. Do so. I want you to discuss it with you tomorrow. He by bowed slightly and went home. He could see a shocked expression in the corner of her eye, but also a faint, knowing smile. Interesting. It was a long night. He was close to escaping, and according to Snithers, Mag Magnolia represented the very viable target. But he didn't want to send her to hell, at least not as a demon. Was it possible to convert everyone to demons? It was a nice thought, if slightly unrealistic. He didn't sleep a wink, and when the sun rose the next day, he waved again away the car that usually took him to work and decided to walk. The Pope was always speaking of austerity. This was an excellent opportunity to practice it, and he could use the time to think. The walls of streets in this part of the city were ancient and narrow. It had changed little in centuries, and he could easily imagine the Romans themselves walking up and down them. Rome was a great place to have true perspective in the matters of time. He would be a demon before long, and he would be one for a long, long time. But then again, he was trapped in heaven. Sing but then again, the idea of, trap of being trapped in heaven, singing hymns to God over and over again forever with no hope of release, that would be a long time as well. He poured himself some coffee, though it took an hour to figure out how the new coffee maker worked. Technology. After he had fixed himself s some, he sat in his office pondering how the day would go. At 9 a.m., he heard Magnolia enter. She settled herself for a few moments at her desk, and then Lampenschirm went in and asked, How have you been? Good. I read it, she smiled. It's interesting. Certainly blasphemous. Completely. They looked at each other for a few moments before they both smiled. They both started to speak at once, and then Lampenschirm gestured to her. I lied about never having read it, she took the manuscript. I was the one who put it where you could see it. I see. Lampenschirm didn't know what to make of that. I wanted you to read it. She turned around and looked at him. He was very cognizant of the fact that she was near and smelled quite good. She was also 40 years younger than him. I did more than read it. He was tempted to take a step back, but he did not. She waited and listened. I decided to become a demon. There was a pause, and then Mar Magnolia laughed. And here I thought I would tumble you into my bed by realizing the futility of existence. That's brilliant. And yet, you're not a demon. Did they refuse you? I need to get three souls, he looked away. This was awkward for him. He felt ashamed, but did not know why. And she thought several moments and blushed crimson. You would do the honor of asking for mine? Lampenshorn was finally shocked. What? How is that an honor? Ask me what I want, she smiled and leaned forward. Lampenshorn knew what she wanted suddenly. She wanted him. What do you want? I want to be a demon, too. Okay. Lampenshorn had been wrong. She leaped up. She reached up and kissed him on the lips at that point. He hadn't felt that since he was 20 years old and felt his blood pounding where it hadn't in a long time either. Taking a deep breath, he said, But to become a demon, you would need three souls as well. I'll find them, but we could be together. There's no future for anyone in heaven, and not none in hell as well. After a pause, Lamp and Sherm nodded. His head swam with the confusion of it all, but at least she was right. The option he chose could be taken by others, if they so chose. No one ch could take it all, but if they could... Are you sure? he asked. She nodded with absolute sincerity. I have never been more sure of anything in my life. So he brought her the contract and she signed it. When she did, instantly, Marmathon appeared in a puff of fire, smoke, and brimstone. He appeared right in, f in the front chambers where she'd signed, but there were none of the special precautions and preparations he had made to allow him to break through the wards of the building. I came because you are the caretaker of the building, Lampensherm, Marmathon said with an honor and horror, and because you are now one of us. I came, I can, can come and go from here as if I, as would any human now. Do you know what you have done? I'm a demon. Lampensherm didn't feel any different, but as far as he thought that, he realized how it could change his form at will. He could do a lot of things that he just suddenly knew he could, and most significant of all, he knew that he would retain his free will. You should shield your thoughts from me at this point, Marmathon said. But yes, you can. Does, Margolia, does Magnolia need three souls as well? 
will settle for two. You see, Lamp and Sherm, you won, and that means I won, and many others who bet on you. It means that you have a new base of power in hell, a new way of getting souls. It means that we can change things. He clasped, clasped his hands greedily behind his back, grinning. Magnolia laughed. That's wonderful. We can save millions, maybe billions. It's a shame we, it's a shame we can't save everyone, Lamp and Sherm sighed. You never get everyone to agree. So many are wedded to their god, Marmothon shook his head. Never underestimate the human capacity for self-deception. With demonic powers, Lamp and Sherm was able to help Magnolia find the soul she needed to make the translation herself. One who wanted nothing more than a magical enhancement or blessing, and another who was fine escaping the trap of heaven. It was a perverted pyramid scheme of sorts, but they went from human to demon and slowly began to increase in numbers. The church was shocked when Lampensherm resigned his cardinalship, but his natural lifespan had, had 20 years more potential life left, and that in the meantime he was going to be helping the recruitment drive on Earth, as well as the conversion of the majority of hell into someplace livable. Dating Magnolia had been quite pleasant, and they had both insisted on it. It wasn't a totally happily ever after, since... That was difficult, given the fact that they were had to volunteer their afterlives, but it was happy for Lamp and Sherman Magnolia, and that was enough for him. As the years passed by, it proved to be more than enough for a great many people. Who knew? If enough humans joined, maybe they'd be able to turn the devil himself up and make it heaven. This has been the Tossing Grenades at Windmills podcast. Buy my book. Have Name Will Travel, available in many markets, including at Amazon.com. Copyright 2018, Red Anvil Amalgamated, LLC. To fight the forces of evil!